Thanks, Philippa. Um, you will have gathered from the introduction that I have a small conflict of interest. I'm uh, slightly implicated in this book. Um, so with that disclaimer, what I have to say today is um, going to try to place the book in some sort of wider context um, and I hope say a few things that uh, nobody dares to say in, in published books, but uh, well, I might get away with uh, in a relatively friendly audience. So I um, wanted to start with uh, some comments on the general policy environment in which New Zealand is beginning to address climate change uh, and some ver and various other post-COVID issues. Uh, New Zealand's political and corporate elites are only just beginning to grapple with climate change as a serious issue. And in this, as in many other respects, we live in a country where the successful neoliberal assault on the state back in the 1980s and 1990s has left the policy-making paralysis. And to see that paralysis in action uh, in relation to building standards, there's a whole chapter in the book by Nigel Isaacs, which is a very sobering review of decades of attempts to improve the, uh, the, the building standards code. The paralysis has several facets. And most obvious of them is the elected leader's loss of legitimacy and confidence, uh, which is reinforced by a culture change in the state bureaucracy under new public management, away from a focus on the effective delivery of services and towards withdrawal from direct engagement um, as a result of splitting policy and operations within the public sector. And then the other aspect of the paralysis is that, as I uh, pointed out in a, in a speech here, or a contribution to a symposium here rather, a couple of weeks ago, um, we, the neoliberal uh, period did left, leave us with a lot of legislative and regulatory provisions which embed neoliberal biases. And um, those biases in the real world work in favour of corporate priorities and against common law protection of the weak, in favour of the rich and against the poor, and against, um, against, in fact, effective regulation by government of, of markets. Now, you do need to remember that the neoliberal vision of the world is a slightly utopian one. It's one of perfect competition, complete contracts, perfect foresight, rational behaviour. Um, and taken to a logical conclusion, that does predict a democratising effect from the operation of the free markets. In the real world, where those conditions don't apply, markets become slaughterhouses in which the strong chop up the weak. And the real risk of coming into dealing with climate change now is that there's too much reliance on the market mechanism without due attention to the regulatory and institutional environment in which the new policies are introduced could potentially be socially quite destructive. And so that, I'm going to work my way through a few themes in this talk um, and more or less come back to that point. One of the things about benefiting the strong against the weak is that among the weak, uh, in, in regulatory terms, because it does not have a vote, is nature. And nature in the short run is indeed weak, but in the long run it is not, because nature holds the trump cards, nature does not negotiate, nature does not compromise. Uh, and so bringing nature into policy making involves a deliberative collective decision to make policy address nature on its, on its own terms. So this book that is now appearing and which I'm now launching is a set of building blocks for a new policy edifice. It's, it recommends new laws, changed incentives, better regulation, new technologies, more skilled and innovative people and public acceptance, very important for abandoning, there's two nice quotes in the book, our preference for relatively low building standards, light-handed regulation and once over lightly remediation of existing buildings in the situation where design, operation and labour market laws all combine to ensure the delivery of minimum performance rather than best performance. We've had three big publications in the last three weeks. One of them is the Climate Change Commission's uh, draft advice for um, consultation, which came out at the end of January. Um, as you'll be aware, this is a classic example of the digital divide at work. No paper copy of this has been printed. 
you can't get your hands on it. You have to print it off the web. If you don't happen to have your web connection and a printer and lots of paper, you don't get to see it. So you can guess which bit of the public of New Zealand is not going to read the report, comment on it, or have access to it. The second one is the Transpower New Zealand's Roadmap for Electrification, which came out on the 10th of February. And the third one is Grant and All Improving Buildings Cutting Carbon, which we're launching today. So I thought it was worth doing a few comparisons across those publications and the issues that they raise. And the first issue that uh, I wanted to address is the question of how important buildings and urban form are in the climate change space. So let's take a couple of points from this book. In Chapter 5, Dowd El et al. says buildings are more than 40% of global energy consumption, about 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions annually. And then there's a, they quote a Vickers study for New Zealand. The built environment contributes 13% of total greenhouse gas emissions, or up to 20% if you include the embodied carbon and imported products. Right, so there's one little set of benchmark estimates. Then chapter 8, Baker and Wilson say 20% of, of 60 megatons of consumption basis emissions in New Zealand are accounted for by building, the built in, in the built environment. So you can see that up there. So we're looking at a substantial slab of New Zealand's emissions. But when you read the Climate Change Commission, you get a different picture. This is their figure showing the breakdown of long-lived gas emissions in 2018. And you can see that buildings are only 3% in that diagram. And if you were to add methane in, uh, buildings then drop to 1.8% of total gross emissions. Here's the Commission's current policy reference scenario. In other, in other words, if existing policies stay in place, what are they predicting emissions will be? And you can see buildings are there as that tiny little thin really brown line. Whereas heat, power, agriculture, forestry, waste, are, are, the action is elsewhere. And here's, when they, here's their proposed path to 2035, where they're putting the government on a budget to bring emissions down. And again, you can see that buildings hardly come over the horizon. And here's their snapshots of the long-lived emissions in their proposed path. And you can see there that buildings are just a small part of the action. The implied message is that buildings is marginal and low priority. The reason for that is partly that only the energy use in buildings is counted. They don't count the construction, the embodied emissions and the energy used in buildings. Um, and they don't include considerations of urban design and the effects of urban design on transport use and therefore on transport emissions. But even so, it looks suspiciously low compared to the sort of numbers that are in, this, in the book. Looking at the Commission's work program, you find that they had no technical, technical reference group on urban design or buildings. They had just one workshop on urban form no citations in the bibli bibliography of their evidence chapter to any of the authors of this book, with the sole exception of Ray Chapman, who pops up in a jointly authored article there. Which suggests to me that the Climate Change Commission is actually working the different intellectual universe from the authors of this book, which in turn suggests that the scope for cross-fertilisation, and most of that cross-fertilisation, I would suggest, is probably from here to there. And then when you come to the advice that the Climate Change Commission has given, buildings in urban form don't really figure. They have, there are three pages in Chapter 7 of the evidence, seven pages of generalities in Chapter 4b, two pages of the main report that assume 60% energy efficiency gain in existing homes, and new, new homes can be a third more efficient, and commercial buildings 30. And then there's a couple of sidelong points about timber can replace emissions and one way to decrease reliance on driving is by designing compact communities. But there's nothing on specific policy except for the one single idea that's in natural gas connections to new homes in 2025, which of course is right, up, right high up on the electricity industry's wish list because it removes one of their competitors out of the energy market. The urban form recommendations from the Commission 
a pretty anodyne. I won't bother reading them to you. There's, there's nothing there that you could really get your teeth into. And you contrast that with the dramatic carbon budget calculations that Chapter 8 of this book sets out. Uh, if the transport part of consumption emissions didn't fall from today's level, the cumulative transport emissions would be 305 million tonnes out, outside the total emissions budget. And if unchanged consumption emissions from living, working and travel within the urban environment alone, and I emphasise those words, could account for several times over the net carbon emissions budget. And the clear conclusions from that in the book. Buildings are several times too carbon intensive. If we don't begin building much more carbon efficient buildings, almost immediately it will be very difficult to reduce the tail of emissions. Transitioning to electric vehicles and building train lines will not suffice when it comes to avoiding transport emissions. Bold reprioritisation is needed in transport patterns and urban form. Uh, there's a, a very different sharp focus here from what you find in the Commission report. You take the Commission recommendations on buildings, and again they're pretty soft except for disconnecting ga natural gas. And you contrast that with what's in this book, which is strong advocacy for zero carbon buildings. Zero carbon concept is central in Chapter 2, which is on the global situation. Chapter 3, which is on New York. Um, 5, on residential buildings. 7, on commercial buildings. And page 80, we have all the technology and know-how we need to reach a net zero commercial building stock now and for the long term. It just takes a holistic approach to design, operation and management of buildings and the National Electrical Group. I'm coming back to that in a minute. So that really brings me to the other big issue that lurks in the discussion uh, of climate change policy, and that's the relationship between decarbonisation and electrification. <coughs> that brings me to the other thing that's appeared in the last couple of weeks, Transpower's roadmap to decarbonisation. And... What Transpower is, is suggesting is effectively complete electrification of transport and process heat, basically within a business as usual economy. And I just had a few comments on where the electricity industry is seeking to position New Zealand in terms of addressing decarbonisation. Whereas both the book and the Climate Change Commission's report are directed towards increasing energy conservation and efficiency across all sectors of the economy as the key to reducing carbon emissions, the electricity industry's vision is to maintain as much as possible of the status quo while replacing all the other energy forms with electricity. In other words, to clear away the competition and give them a big market. That means a massive increase in required electricity supply from which the industry hopes to profit if all the required investment is stimulated by market forces. And the problem that that highlights is trying to achieve big collective goals with the machinery of unbridled market capitalism, which is what we've let loose in our electricity sector. <coughs> the industry's profit-maximising ambitions require that Firstly, the, the economy decarbonises just by buying much more electricity. Second, the economic transformation that reduces electricity demand is not particularly welcome. Thirdly, that 100% renewable generation under the current market model would drive down the wholesale price, so it is to be blocked. Fourthly, that distributed renewables like rooftop solar and small-scale wind are potential competitors to the incumbent gen tailors, so shutting them out as much as possible is a goal is why they're trying to kill the fixed, uh, char low fixed charge regulation. Then there's the big expansion of wind on which the Commission relies for its extra electricity generation. Um, and that expansion of wind power, I'll show you the diagram in a moment, is hostage to the fact that the industry has got control of the most attractive wind farm sites and has got them consented and has then banked them. It's been sitting on them undeveloped, and they can continue to sit on them undeveloped and hold essentially policy hostage until the economic incentives are given to them to bring them into production. If possible, the industry will want to keep the TY Point aluminium smelter open to keep demand pressing out against supply. So 
there's a discordance between the strategic positioning of the electricity industry guys pursuing, let's face it, profit-maximising objectives as they are supposed to do and the collective needs of decarbonising the economy. So just this one's a diagram from the Transpower uh, proposals and you can see that they're, what they're doing is saying, well, let's have two car households uh, and just replace the internal combustion vehicles with electric vehicles, job done. Um, here's, their trend, here's their road transport projections. We just stick that, stay on, stay on, on course. Rail electrification not mentioned in the road map. So the electricity industry wants to transform the energy inputs to a relatively untransformed economy and society, which means they want the government to force the pace on electricity demand by incentivising electric vehicles and process heat. And they want certainty and they want RMA reform um, and, of course, no change to the current electricity market setup. Now... Um, so this is the Climate Change Commission. The Climate Change Commission also wants massive expansion of supply. And you can see the grey wedge there is what they need, what they're projecting from wind. Basically, their projections rely extremely heavily on getting wind farms into production really quickly over the next 10 to 15, 15 years. And as I've mentioned before, that requires access to the sites. And the Commission does worry about how they're going to achieve this under the current model, but they really only nibble at the edges of it. To their credit, they look for more independent entry, including some solar. And the Commission does push for biomass as, as well as electricity for process heat, which trims away some of Transpower's ambitions. It does note that energy efficiency is the substitute for increased electricity supply. It does argue for more independent generation, but it never ever suggests any transformation of the electricity markets into institutional setup. Now this book, to my relief, does venture into that territory, even if only somewhat cautiously. Chapter 7 makes a bold argument on the demand side that moving to net zero emission buildings represents a possible competitor to increased electricity supply. And indeed, that if you really push net zero, building in the commercial building stock, it could actually free up enough electricity for a lot of the electricity, the electric vehicle demand. And Chapter 12, which is a little beauty, um, covers the, what it calls the unintended consequences of removing the low fixed charge regulations, uh, which does mean directly engaging with the electricity market structure and regulation. And that is actually the best critique that I've seen anywhere of the very flawed plan the government is currently pushing through um, to abolish the low fixed charge regulations. So my basic point here is that the real elephant in the room with climate change policy, from my point of view, is that the electricity market is broken and it's broken by design, and that design is a design which will profit mightily from climate change policy. Climate change policy is a gold mine for the current owners of the electricity cartel. And government is the biggest single shareholder in that. So it loves the dividends and it loves the tax receipts. It insists that its stake in the modern mixed ownership companies doesn't give it actually the ability to dictate what they do. And that leaves us with a very difficult situation, it seems to me. The strategic goal is to maximise demand and block the path to 100% renewables. So long as there are fossil fuels in the mix of generation, they will be on the margin of the market and they'll set the spot price. So long as fossil fuels are on the margin of the market and setting the price, every increase in the price of carbon goes directly into the price of all electricity, which goes through to electricity consumers. The viability of small-scale distributed generation like rooftop solar is very sensitive to the price structure and taking away the low fixed charge regulations potentially knocks out um, as Chapter 12 of the book suggests, um, anything up to a half of the number of households that would find it efficient to retrofit with rooftop solar. And the big threat is the huge wind resource, which has been locked up and banked by the Gentilers. So it seems to me that without institutional change, government policy is hostage to the stranglehold of the electricity industry. And so I thought I'd just leave the last word to Helen Vigors.
Um, she said, although my chapter is entitled Unintended Consequences of the Removal of Low Fixed User Charge Regulations, bit of a mouthful, <clears throat> it's apparent from reading the electricity company submissions to the Electricity Price Review that the reduction in the economic viability of small distributed generation is an entirely intended consequence for them. So, go and buy the book.